Well, welcome to a special talking about kids podcast is being held in conjunction with the Arizona Alliance for Absent Health. Our topic today is the media and commercialism on adolescents. And if you're joining us with the webinar right now, and if you have any questions for our guest today, go ahead and type them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Of course, you'll probably have a lot of questions because our guest today is Susan Lynn. She's the author of numerous books, including Consuming Kids, The Case for Make Believe, and most recently, Who's Raising the Kids. She's a psychologist, as well as a world-renowned ventriloquist. And we're so excited to have you here today, Susan. Uh, I've heard Vinny say what a fan he is. I am, of course, a big fan of your work. Um, I guess I would like for all of the members and all the listeners to hear a little bit about what got you interested in this field, in particular, interested in what kind of modern, the modern economy and media is doing to young people? Um, I got interested in the impact of um, big tech and big business on children when I was raising a child at home and I was working with very low income kids and um, I could see um, I could see how commercialism was just invading the lives of all the children, you know, that I knew and cared about. And um, I really believe that we would have a better world if the best interests of children were put first. And what happens when commercial culture, when uh, corporations invade the life of children's and children and families, is that profit becomes more important than anything else. And decisions are made that may benefit the corporation, but they basically undermine children and families. That was just really clear to me um, starting in the late 1990s. And um, it seemed to me that this was a social justice issue um, mm. about it's basically the rights of children to grow up and the freedom for parents to raise them without being undermined by greed. And so I, it, it seemed to me and some colleagues that we needed an activist organization to address these issues. And um, that's how Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood, which is now called Fair Play, was formed. In, in your book, um, Who's Raising the Kids, you, you make multiple arguments and, and you cite a lot of different research about all the ways that kind of modern consumerism and the ways that products are marketed at kids is harming kids and particularly young kids. I want to start with this strange notion that branded products are actually more harmful for kids than unbranded um, products. Let, let's discuss that a little bit, if that's okay, Susan. Well, I mean, a branded ball is probably less harmful than unbranded poison for kids. So, right. you know, I mean, but, but basically, um, the problem is that in, in, in children's lives, in the media they consume, in, in the products um, that that target them, um, acquisition becomes more important than anything else. And, um, and brands, you know, particularly with adolescents become a way of defining themselves. Um, in the book, I talk about going to a marketing conference and hearing people talk about tribes. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, you know, we kind of belong to tribes and that has positive and negative implications for the world. But what she was talking about is organizing tribes around brands. Right. And, and so basically what, what happens is that, and what the companies want is to create lifetime brand loyalty, uh, which is incredibly valuable to them. And brand loyal customers, um, they don't notice price changes. They don't necessarily notice when quality you know, disintegrates. And um, that's, again, it's great for corporations, but it's not so good for the um, the kids. 
you know, in the book, another example you gave is about showing a group of, again, young kids, but you showed them three different puppets. Mm -hmm. And one was an amorphous puppet. One was what you, you describe as looking more like either a horse or a donkey. And the third puppet that you showed them was Cookie Monster. And what did you, what happened when you showed them those different puppets? And what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, so actually it wasn't young children, it was adults. Oh, okay. Um, I, 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 do, I do a lot of talking um, with and for, you know, adults who work with children, you know, teachers, therapists, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, my point in doing this is that um, branded toys, for instance, deprive us of our imagination and the experience of creating. So when I had the unbranded puppet, um, I said, what is it? And there was absolutely no agreement on what it was. And the reason for that is that um, what it, because it didn't tell people what it was, what people thought it was depended on themselves and their individual life experience. So, um, in all the, you know, people thought it was all sorts of things. They couldn't agree it was male, it was female, it was a worm, it was a elephant, I mean, who knows? So that, that was one. And then when we got to the puppet that looked like a horse, there was basic agreement that it was either a horse, a donkey, maybe a llama. Um, but, you know, it was sort of that kind of animal. So already people's imagination was being stifled and their creativity was being stifled. On the other hand, they didn't know how the horse talked. They didn't know if it was, you know, male or female. They didn't know anything about it. So there was still a lot of room for creativity. And then when I took out the Cookie Monster puppet, first of all, there was a collective, oh, you know, I mean, everybody loves the Cookie Monster. And then when I said, what is it? Everybody knew what it was, they knew its name. And I said, what does it say? And everybody said, me want cookie. And mm -hmm. so my point was that when toys are linked to media programs, um, the, they come with scripts. And basically there's less um, effort that kids need to put into the toys to create them. And playing, you know, which is essential, creative play, which is essential for um, children's and adolescents and adult health and development, um, it takes effort. But when you already know what it is and what it talks like, um, first of all, it's hard to change that. And second of all, it's just so much easier to slide into that. And it, it is interesting that it's not just children who are affected by that, but also adults. And you go on to kind of make the link then too that these, these licensed or branded toys the way that they extend play is by motivating you to buy more or different right. versions of it, the latest version, the latest incarnation, rather than sticking with the one toy that can be played with in myriad ways for a longer period. Yeah, I mean, the, there's an, a saying that goes, the best toys are 90% child and only 10% toy. Right. The best toys just lie there until somebody picks them up and does something with it, create, you know, creates with it. Um, so toys that come with all sorts of bells and whistles are less useful. They're less useful to us and they're less useful uh, to children. But a trend that is, is very concerning now um, is that toys come in series. Mm. And so the message is, um, as that old, potato chip ad said, you know, you can't just eat one. You can't just have one toy, it's not enough. And the toys are marketed as, as a series. And so when you get a toy, the message is that you have to buy 
buy the next one and the next one and the next one until, you know, it's all complete. And, you know, we live, you know, in this climate crisis where, you know, that is, is if you'll excuse the word fueled by consumption mm. and the idea that we are immersing children in this world where consuming is a not just a positive value, but really the only important value. Basically, we are training them um, in habits that will not only, you know, destroy them, but will destroy the planet. Another thing that you've observed and, and that you write about is kind of the level of interaction with the toys that young children are given. And I think this is this is kind of subtle, if I may, Susan, because I know that a lot of toys um, market themselves as being interactive. They, they request a response from the kid, from the user. And that's often accompanied with a sound and, a, and lights and all of that. Um, you don't necessarily think that these very quote unquote interactive toys are interactive, do you? I actually think describing toys that chirp and beep and talk and move all by themselves or that require specific answers, which a lot of apps, which brand themselves as interactive, a lot of apps do that. I think um, interactive is a misnomer. Really, they're reactive. They encourage reaction. They do not encourage initiating interaction. It's not true interaction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing that I think it's really important um, to remember is that when the new technologies started to get really popular um, and the, the, the marketing push was to diss television. Oh, television is so passive, but these toys, these are interactive. And, you know, the, I, I, I'm, I mean, television, you know, was certainly problematic. It's still problematic in terms of pushing consumerism, you know, and a whole bunch of other things. But the, but in terms of creativity, I mean, my preference would be to have kids watch a good movie or a good story that, that, that's not passive. That triggers a lot of thinking and, and reflection and much more than a lot of these so-called interactive games and apps that just require, you know, swiping, tapping, you know, whatever, and really don't encourage any kind of creativity at all. Benny, Pierre, do you have any questions at this point for Susan? Yeah, you know, I, I, I do, Brad, like, you know, first of all, thinking to adolescence as, as young people discover their ego strength, you know, like comparison thinking is so common. And, and, and I, I can, I can see where, where an adolescent might sort of judge themselves according to what they feel is norms for possession and consumption. But Susan, taking a look at, you know, how do you extend the 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 what do you elaborate around creative play for younger children to what play might look like for the adolescent video games i think that's that's something that they they are immersed in and the, the technology interface is different granted they come with brands they come with series but how does that apply to that particular context well um you know again it it would depend on the video games um, but the popular video games are designed to, as all of the new technology is designed, is to capture adolescents or, or adult, you know, attention to keep them glued and also to sell them things. And one of the things is these games, they're often called sandbox games. Because, you know, the idea is that because you can play these with other people and even people around the world, and that that has the potential to be really great. But what also happens is that that a lot of these games like Fortnite um, are called freemiums, which means that they're marketed as free and you can play the game for free. 
but they're constantly selling um, upgrades so that you can decorate your avatar and you know you can get cool things. And so when you're playing with other other people around the world, they can see whether you've been spending money on on your avatar, how snazzily your avatar is dressed, or what accessories you have. And so you know basically you can tell who's rich, who's poor, whose parents will buy things, whose parents won't. Um, so it really, you know, becomes a class, um, a class thing. And what it does is foment longing to have all these things. And, and you know, th that's, you know, a belonging is a big deal in adolescence. And, and, um, and, and, how how they look, how they construct themselves, um, it often it matters to them, and I think that that extends, you know, to the avatar. And one of the things that actually so annoys me about these games being called sandbox games is that in a sandbox, there's no corporation trying to sell you anything. <laughs> and and yeah. and one of the worries about you know the the fact that so many adolescents are living lives online is that everything they do is mediated by a corporation, mm -hmm. which does not have their best interests at heart. You you point out and and you cite you know work by both Tim Kazer and Juliet Shore that there's a lot of good research that this kind of materialism. That these games can engender is actually really bad for kids. That it's correlated with a, with many many harm things. Can for our listeners, can you kind of explain how um, materialism has been shown to be detrimental? Well, I mean, it, materialism, um, the belief that the things that buy will you buy will make you happy. Um, is actually associated with depression in, in kids and also, you know, in older kids and adolescents as well. Um, kids with materialistic values are less li likely to try to do things to improve the environment. They're less mm -hmm. likely to participate in recycling, for instance. And I know recycling is complicated, um, but... Um, and 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 they also foment a lot of discontent. And mm. and the disconnect content comes it this way. If you believe that things will make you happy, what do you do? You buy a thing. So you have a thing. And so what the research is showing is that things don't make you happy in any kind of sustained way. You may get a rush, it may last for a little while but it's not sustained. So you bought this thing and then you discover it didn't make you happy, but you believe that things will make you happy. So what do you do? You buy another you buy thing, a bigger thing, a better thing. And it's this constant cycle of dissatisfaction and, and of turning to a way of, of, of addressing that dissatisfaction that in fact, just increases more dissatisfaction. Yeah, and I think that listeners uh, of the Talking About Kids podcast will might be reminded of um, how important efficacy is and to resilience. And any time that you take what should be something that you hold within you and you externalize it, um, you diminish that efficacy you're undermining your resilience. And I think this is part of what's happening there. Am I right, Susan? Yes, and and also what that you know makes me think about is um, that's another problem with a, a life that is lived mostly online. Mm. And and um, first of all, um, you're not initiating; you're you're reacting. Second of all, people are trying um, you know constantly you know to sell you things. But also, it doesn't take any init initiation. And so you're not really learning to be effective the way you would be if you were out in the world, um, you know, 
dealing with nature or co coping with life. Um, and um, I, I, I think that this, you know, all tech all the time um, world that we are creation, creating really engenders passivity. Yeah. That was what I was going to say, Susan, is it sounds like it's a public health issue. <laughs> It is a public health uh, and, issue. And if There's so, no question about that. You know, what What do you think the ramifications will be in the next, say, two decades, three decades? How How do you think our society will look and, and how will we interact with each other because of what we're creating right now? Um, first of all, at, because it's a public health issue, advocacy groups and groups like yours are just so important because that's how it's gonna change. I mean, this is about, this needs societal change. It's not a, just a, fa it's not a family problem. It manifests as one, but it really isn't. And, um, and one thing that is encouraging to me, I mean, having been doing this work for over 20 years, is that for the first time, there really are advocacy groups all over the country working to address the commercialism, to uh, address the big tech's takeover of children's lives. And that is encouraging to me. Um, I mean, there, are, there are, are bills in Congress that have bipartisan support, which in and of itself is shocking, that would actually change for the better how tech companies interact you know, with kids and adolescents. So, um, so I think that that's encouraging, but what is really, um, I don't wanna be hysterical about this, but terrifying is the word that comes to mind, is what will happen if we don't deal with this. You know, we are, you know, being pushed um, into the metaverse, yeah. you know, where this virtual world where you have an avatar and where, you know, basically you can live your life and um, and now we have AI, um, which is going you know going to hugely change our lives. And one of the things that is so concerning is, first of all, who owns the meta metaverse, right? I mean, the marketing that is going on there and is going to go on there is just you know horrific. And um, so that that's that's very concerning. But also, I, I think what we have to remember is that with AI, with the metaverse, with, with you know, tech and going back to television and, and whatever, that marketing, it doesn't just sell products, it, it sells values. True. And, and so what, what marketing doesn't value, for instance, is critical thinking. Marketers don't want people to think critically because they don't want them to think too much about their products. They want them, you know, they um, reducing friction is um, a Jeff Bezos term where, you know, you need to make buying things as easy as, as possible. They, so they want impulse buying, impulse buying um, and, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. In, in impulse buying and um, and and not not thinking critically about the world, those are um, are traits that are would, will really end democracy. Democracy relies on people who think critically. It, they rely on imagination. Democracy relies on imagination. Um, the marketing world promotes me first, right? right? It's all about me and taking care of me and what I have. And um, they don't care about cooperation. But, but, but democ that's what democracy needs. And, you know, if we think of, of not just the immediate health and mental health of children and adolescents, and we go beyond that, what they are, they're future citizens. And um, and they're not, um, we're, we're luring them into worlds that will purposely deprive them of 
of experiencing what it's like to think critically. Yeah. What it's like to cooperate. That is is so troubling. And um yeah, I mean that's 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 really you know worrisome. And if you combine that with what overconsumption is doing and will continue to do to the environment. Um, it's enough to keep me up at night. Yeah. You know, Susan, I really think of critical consciousness and critical thinking as a developmental asset. And how, when I yes. think of, when I think of how, uh, some, some of the campaigns to reduce um, tobacco use in young people, for example, it was about seeing the unseen hand of big tobacco and hey, they're playing with you. And you, you know, you, 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 it really how, how that spurs young people into into behaviors, uh, avoidance uh, avoidance behaviors, but you know, Susan, I always think of levers of change. Clearly, there's a policy lever, and it's good to see that that's happening. But at the level of of, of parents and young people, how can parents reframe this the, this narrative and reframe this thread, mm -hmm. especially when you, when you haven't started early, especially yes. as we approach the season of gift giving and and and, and consumption. What can parents do? One thing is, um, however old your children are, is to look at your own consumption. I mean, if you value, you know, if materialism is incredibly important to you, it's going to be important to your kids as well. So that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is to, to, you know, talk honestly with your kids about what you but what your feelings are, what your concerns are. Um, and and also to help kids know that there are things that they can do about it. And one thing that is kind of is is exciting is that there are more young people sort of you know standing up and saying, you know, we don't want Google Classroom in our schools. You know, we're we're going to um we're not going to just be on our cell phones all the time. I mean, there's this group of um, of kids in New York who's who made the New York Times because of their you know their efforts to really say no to you know the tech and commercial world. So I think that 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 is concerning. But parents, the thing is that parents can't do it all by themselves. It would yeah. be really helpful if schools took this on as well, so that the kids were getting it not just at home. Um, it, it helps if if families have other family friends with kids the same age as yours who share your values, so the kids don't feel like they're the only ones. Um, there's a great group called Wait Until Eighth that helps parents around the country join together uh, to make a decision, like in your child's class, not to get a smartphone until eighth grade. Um, so I, I think that, um, that that there are things that we can do. It is harder, you know? I mean, it, it just is. Um, then it's easier if you start from the beginning. I mean, you're right about that. But there are things that parents can do. And some families, like when kids come in the house, everybody, there's a place for their phones. Or if that's too much for your family, carve out one night a week where all of you are off your devices. Or, or make family meals. First of all, have family meals if you can. And also make them tech-free. And it's not just your child giving up the device, you're giving it up as well. Uh, does that make sense to you? Do you have any thoughts about that I missed about how to deal with this? No, but you know, I was thinking about, because you, you talk about um, thinking critically, you talk about reflecting, you talk about setting values, and you also talk in your book about how some of that requires quiet. Um, and you, you learned a little bit about quiet from one of your more uh, famous collaborators. Can you share that with the audience? Sure. I was um, so fortunate um, to have opportunities to work with Fred Rogers. So 
um, with my puppets, I appeared on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I also made videotapes about difficult issues for kids. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, about difficult issues for kids with, um, with his production company, you know, issues like homelessness and racism. Um, and I learned a lot from him. And one of the things I learned that I really had never thought about was the importance of silence. Silence was really important to him. It was so important to him that he actually talked about it on the show and actually had a full minute of silence on one of his shows which, you know, in the television world, that, you know, was um, amazing. But but we are so inundated with noise everywhere, all the time. And, and noise, having noise all around us prevents us even from thinking, and it prevents us from reflection, and it prevents us from, from creating. And so um, encouraging silence, you know, in your family, not as a punitive thing, but you know, really as something to celebrate, I think is really important. Susan, I, I'm such a fan of your work. Um, your books are amazing. I really, really enjoy them. And I recommend all the listeners um, pick them up, read them, in particular, the most recent, Who's Raising the Kids. And thank you so much for being a guest on Talking About Kids. Well, it's my pleasure, and it was great talking to you.